to a, and then uh, we'll move to um, what is exactly happening and why is it happening? And finally, what might we do about it? So I'm gonna start with a very personal story. Does anyone um, recognize the scene playing out for you in this image on the screen at the moment? Anyone recognize any of this? I'm not seeing any comments or raised hands. <laughs> well, yeah, go ahead, Ari. Did you want to say something? No, uh, people are, are, are chatting. They're saying Christmas carols, singing Christmas carols. Um, Great. Yeah, a lot of Christmas carols. So that's what I'm saying. Okay, well, that's precisely right. It's interesting because when I show this kind of an image in Israel, it doesn't have as much uptake. So uh, way back in the day when I was growing up in London, um, which is where the accent comes from, um, I, uh, for the first few years of my life, I went to a, a, a state school. I, now, because there's no separation of church and state in many European countries, the UK included, um, it was called a state school, but it was officially known as a Church of England school, which meant that when it came to things like Christmas, there were all kinds of uh, class activities that might take you into directions that had something to do with Christianity. So um, I'm quite musical. Um, I was always interested in music and I loved singing. And I was part of this school in which, um, you know, the whole class was going out and they were going caroling in the local shopping center. And I was seven years, seven, eight years old. It was absolutely clear to me that this was not something I was supposed to do because I was a Jewish kid and I grew up in a fairly orthodox home and my parents were observant. So there was no doubt in my mind that this was not something I should do, but I really wanted to do it. And so what I did was I thought, well, no one's really looking. I can just go along. We're going at lunchtime on a Wednesday afternoon to sing carols in the shopping center. Who's gonna know? So I went along, joined in, had a great time. But unfortunately, one of the uh, congregants of our shul happened to see me, an old lady who was usually pretty friendly to me and used to hand out sweets after the service, but uh, saw me there and uh, mentioned this to my mother. Um, I won't get into the conversation I had with my mother, but it was made very clear to me that this was not the kind of thing that Jews do. Jews don't carol. And there's a reason for that. We don't believe in Jesus and uh, we don't celebrate Christmas and there's reasons for that. So we got into a whole conversation about it. I, the, the, the conversation wasn't actually necessary because I knew everything that she was saying to me, even in advance of going out there and joining in the caroling. But what this I think represents is that as late as, as recently as the 1970s, when this happened, it was very clear how believe believing and belonging were connected. There was a very tight connection between them. So if, you could, if we can scroll down and move to our next image. Um, you know, being, um, being Jewish and celebrating Christmas for a Jew growing up in London in the 1970s was not something that, you know, you could, you could, you know, it wasn't something that you could do a little bit of or a little bit, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. It was one, one or the other. You can either celebrate Christmas or you can be Jewish. You can't be both. Now that was back then. In a very short time since then, if we move down uh, a, a little bit further, um, and this is from the Pew Report before, uh, oh, hang on a second. No, just before we get to the Pew Report. Baruch Spinoza, um, um, is I think a great example of how it's the, the, the notion of believing and belonging was so tightly connected that if you didn't believe in what the rest of the community believed, you couldn't belong to that community. So Baruch Spinoza was, you know, excommunicated in the 17th century from the Amsterdam Jewish community because of his writings, which called into question the validity of several beliefs associated with the Bible and with Jewish tradition. So the notion of someone not sharing the same beliefs and still belonging to the same community was not an option. If we move down a little bit further to our own times, closer to our own times, still before you know, the age, the, 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 
summit of social media, we see some different things happening. So in the Pew report before last in 2013, um, there was one of the many, many things were written about the Pew report and lots of debate in the Jewish community of North America about what was going on in the Jewish community. But there was a number of really interesting statistics which seemed to pass most people by. And this is one of them. If you look at this uh, question, this fairly innocuous question, what is compatible with being Jewish? Can a person be Jewish if? And there are a number of different options. Works on the, if, if he works on the Sabbath, is strongly critical of Israel, does not believe in God. And then at the bottom, you have this one, believes that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, very interestingly, over a third of Jews in the United States in 2013 thought that this belief was compatible with being Jewish. Now, there may be all kinds of reasons for that, which we won't get into. But for me, what's interesting at this point is that you can already see that the connection between believing and belonging has begun to unravel, that no longer is there that this tight connection, that unless you believe what the rest of the group believes, you can't belong to that group. This has already begun to unravel. Now, this is all before the age of the internet, in a way, because 2013, you're really looking at people before um, over half of the population has smartphones, before social media have really taken off, um, especially among millennials and, and Generation Z, who are their greatest users and advocates. We'll come to see what that means a bit later on. But this is kind of really in the very early days of the internet as we know it today. Let's move, uh, move down and look at something that's a little bit more contemporary. This is, this is a series of screenshot shots from my own phone. I'm gonna put the leaf to one side for a moment. And I wanna think about uh, belonging more generally. So many of you will be familiar with this. This is literally what would happen if you took your cell phone and flicked your thumb across between three different applications. This is the kind of thing that you might see on your own phone. So on the left-hand side is WhatsApp, which is very popular in Israel. It's the equivalent of you know, the Apple messaging thing over here because of Apple saturation in the US. Many people don't use WhatsApp here in Israel. It's very popular, but it's basically a messaging, uh, a messaging app. Um, you have in the middle um, my Twitter feed, um, not my Twitter feed, my, what's being fed to me through Twitter. And then on the right-hand side, on the right-hand column, you have just my email, which contains a number of different email accounts. Um, and what you can see is, is that even within one of these columns, in order to get through your day, you're literally walking in and out of different groups from moment to moment. I can one minute be in pluralism leadership. In my, if you look at the WhatsApp column on the left-hand side, I can one minute be um, interacting with students in a course that I'm giving at the university. The next one down, it will be people in the tenants association of my apartment block. Further down, it will be my son or my uh, mother and, and her favorite grandchildren. Um, so I'm constantly moving and responding to different groups throughout the day. That's just within one application. But then as I move between, I'm actually moving between different kinds of communities on a more global scale. Um, so if I move to the middle column, I am I'm in interacting with other Liverpool football club supporters, or I'm, or, uh, I'm following Erica Brown's uh, um, daily Talmud tweet that she was doing at the time. Um, and on the right hand side, I have a, an entirely different personality and a different set of um, relationships. And I'm um, the, the ways in which I belong to others and others belong to me through my work relations and so on is playing out in a whole other column on, on the right hand side. So this is something that's very familiar. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But what I would like to raise at this point is a question. Looking at that page of this moving in and out of different communities, different relationships and different forms of belonging, what would be your expectation of what would happen to the connection between belief and belonging? How would belief and belonging change in, in terms of their relationship under the circumstances where you're constantly moving in and out of different groups? Any thoughts? 
So you're going to have to help me, Ari, here, I'm afraid, with the chat because I don't see it. I am. I'm, wa I'm waiting for people to start chatting. So um, please, uh, Gail, Gail says confusion. Um, Lainey says it would be, it would hinge on like, uh, let's see, sorry, I lost it. Hinge on the same beliefs to belong. Can't, I, mean, I mean, are you, uh, maybe the question is, are people now part of multiple different communities or are all the communities that they're in, are they basically the same? Um, are they are they listening to different voices or, are they, or or is everything across the platforms you're sharing basically an echo chamber? Um, Deb says that people are in so many different groups. Maybe that then makes their affiliation um, more loose. In other words, in the old days, you were in one group and you were tight with that group. And now you have so many groups you're involved with. You just you, you you're really uninvolved in a way. Um, you're probably also getting so, it, it creates in other words this creates the groups get i mean i guess the question is does this make you more connected or less connected maybe um right right so i you know keep the comments coming and i'll try and address as many as i can as we move forward but i'd like to take some of the things that were said here and uh, piggyback on those because what we have here is it raises a really interesting question. If you're moving between so many groups so frequently, so fast, you'd expect that the connections with those groups would, would generally become weaker, that you would not belong in the same way to any one group because there is only so much of you to go around. There's only so much belonging to divide up between these different associations and these different relationships. And under those conditions, you might expect that what you had seen previously, this unraveling of the connection between believing and belonging that we saw even in the Pew study of 2013, might actually, you'd expect it to go even further down that route, that, down that route, that that road would continue, that you would see belief and belonging to become increasingly dissociated from each other. You'd expect people to be more hybrid and more fluid in their beliefs. But in fact, that's not what we see. So our expectation is that people would become more loosely connected to groups and their beliefs would be more loosely connected to the groups that they associate with. But in fact, we see something that is radically different. So let's move down and see what we do see. So one of the first things we see is a dramatic uh, fall in any kind of religious association or religious belief. Um, as um, Jean Twenge, who's a sociologist who uh, wrote the book literally on Gen Z, she, she calls them iGen, but this is the generation that grew up with the smartphone. In her words, as soon as the smartphone reached Generation Z and religious belief and practice and affiliation dropped off a cliff, those were her words, it dropped off a cliff. Now, secularization has been going on in the world for at least a couple of hundred years, and it's been a slow decline. And there were a number of years in which the United States of America was considered to be a counterexample to what was happening elsewhere in the developed world. But actually, what's happened in the last couple of decades is that America has speeded up dramatically in terms of secularization. Fewer and fewer people believe in God. More and more people describe them as non-affiliated or, or having no religion. And so what's happening in America is really picking up where uh, Europe was perhaps um, 10 or even 20 years ago. But one of the things that has become remarkable is that the pace of this secularization is much faster among millennials and Generation Z. And the question is, what is it that might be doing this? So if we can move down a little and look at um, Yeah, so here's just, this just, as another summary, this is a more recent study published by a Christian group. And they basically found that among Generation Z, there are twice as many atheists as in any previous cohort. So you're seeing something that's very, very dramatic. In a short number of years, we're seeing something that is very unusual sociologically. Okay, so let's keep moving. But on the other hand, we're seeing other patterns of believing and belonging. 
in addition to people belonging less and believing less, you also have a whole bunch of people in the United States believing more strongly in things which are, you know, perhaps less uh, believable. <laughs> is that the rise of conspiracy theories and the extent to which people believe in them, and some of these are remarkable. Um, you know, the Ill Illuminati secretly control the world is believed by 21% of Americans. There's a deep state working against President Donald Trump, 29%. It's a very recent survey. Um, these are very remarkable figures demonstrating that, well, belief in God and association with religion might be going down. But beliefs of other kinds and association with other kinds of groups seem to be on the rise. So what you see is kind of a dual pattern that there are some things, some parts of our lives in which belief and belonging are coming apart and, and going down. And there are other parts in which they seem to be coming together and going up. Let's uh, continue. Yeah, we're also seeing in the area of believing and belonging, the relationship between the two, that um, political polarization is at one of its all time highs. This diagram actually made a lot of noise in the scientific community uh, when it was first published. It's a diagram of the retweets um, of politically motivated tweets. And what you can see is, is that the reds retweet to the reds, <laughs> the blues retweet to the blues, and there's very little interaction between the two. Is that what Ari said earlier, or I, I don't know if you're quoting someone or, or, or this was your own view, but what you're seeing is echo chambers. Um, and increasingly that means, and in terms of what, uh, of what interests us, this notion of uh, believing and belonging, either having a loose connection or a tight connection, this is an, a very good example of belief and belonging having very tight connections, is that the sources, the news items, that people trust and believe in. They share among themselves in the groups to which they belong, but they don't have much interaction with any other groups who have their own sets of beliefs and they, and they share those among the group that they belong to. We can move down a little. So what is it that's really happening here? What I am going to argue is that what you're seeing is that you're seeing these two kinds of extreme reaction. It's almost like the middle ground has been vacated and that people are either going for a very tight connection between belief and belonging, or they're going for a, such a loose one that they drop out of it altogether. And what we're seeing from these phenomena that we've just reviewed these are different expressions of those two extremes. Um, I'm gonna pause here for a moment to if, see if anyone has any comments or, or questions about what we've done so far, because this is my sort of analysis of where we've come in the age of the internet in terms of belief and belonging. But before I move on to look at why and how this is happening and what we might do about it, um, I, I just wonder if there's any thoughts that people have about either how this relates to them or questions that they have about some of these phenomena. So the, the chat is open. You can chat and I will moderate. But while, while people are thinking about what to chat, I had a question, which is, um, is there an overlap? In other words, can you, can you have people who are strong believers in religion? Are that, is that the same group also that is now strong believers in conspiracy theories? or are they separate groups? What, what is the research showing? So the, the research has shown that there is a, a considerable overlap between certain kinds of, in the United States, between certain kinds of conspiracy theories and certain kinds of evangelical religion. There is a degree of overlap. However, it's not as much as you might expect. Um, that these are separate kinds of belief systems. You can have, on the one hand, people who are highly religious and uh, believe very strongly in religion who completely reject conspiracy theories and vice versa. There are some very secular, um, secular individuals who are, who are believers in conspiracy theories. So there is a connection because there is a certain group within 
the conspiracy theorist world that is religiously motivated, but that doesn't account for all of them by any means. Gail says she's, she can see that younger generations are like this. What about older generations who are not, I mean, are they, they are, I mean, are they being impacted as well to, an, to such an extent? Or are they not because they're not as technologically uh, involved? But look at all the people on, on our CSP site and all the people now in the last year who've actually now gone on to um, you know, social media. So has that affected the other generations as well recently? So it has affected them, but much less so. It's like, it's very much more pronounced among the younger generation. And that is one of the things that is most interesting here is that when we think about what's causing this, how is this happening? Um, that's one of the things that is a good, a big clue. It's that there's something about those generations, especially generations, even more so the millennials, that is very different. Now, the trends are there to some extent with older generations, but much, much less pronounced. Herb wants to know um, whether what we're seeing is purely the result, of, I'm, I'm interpreting Herb's question, of the advance in social media, or is it also related to our educational system? And by the way, is this unique to the United States or is this you're seeing this millennials all around the world like in Israel as well? So um, there's been less study of millennials outside of the Uni United States. The United States has taken a particular interest in millennials and Generation Z. Uh, but yes, these patterns are being observed elsewhere in Europe in particular, um, but they seem especially pronounced here in America. I'm just looking okay. to see if anything else asked, but. Um, so okay. yes, in response to that question about, is this just social media or are there other things going on? That's exactly what I want to get into. It's like, okay, what is happening? And how, you know, what is, what is the cause of all of this? Now, obviously there are many things going on in our world and to pin down one particular cause would be crazy, but I do want to look at a couple of things which seem to be especially pertinent. So let's, so let's pause, so I'm gonna tell you another story. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, beginning. So if you could just scroll up a tiny bit, I don't know if people can see the bottom of this picture. Um, yeah, because I'd like you to see. So there's a bit of captioning at the bottom. So this is uh, a screenshot of a tweet that I received in a group of old school friends who talk politics and bad dad jokes. Uh, most of the time. And they occasionally, you know, every, every so often they'll post something that's contentious about Israel or some new ridiculous political correctness that someone in the group is crazy about. Um, so this was a tweet that I received um, about a year ago, maybe less actually, maybe a few months ago, um, of a woman uh, speaking in Arabic, looked like a Palestinian woman, um, who was claiming that Big Ben Yes, that Big Ben, the one in London, uh, was stolen from Palestine by the British in 1922. And those who are interested in looking up this stuff, I've actually sent Ari a few links, and you can go down the rabbit hole with me, uh, you know, in writing and really follow this through thin. I'm not going to have time here to go completely down the rabbit hole with you. But basically what happened was, is that I was faced with something that all of us, I think, get into our inbox or into our um, messages or into our Facebook pages, we'll see something like this, where someone is making what looks like an outrageous claim. And what would you do? What do you do when that happens? So if this had come into your inbox, or you'd seen this on your Facebook or some, or some Twitter feed that you're in, what would you do about it? Um, people have said, most people are saying they would ignore it. Some people say they would delete it. Jerry said that, um, they would laugh, delete, ignore. Oh, uh, Sue Orbach says something that I would do if I got this from one of my crazy relatives, which is I would Snopes them. So I would take this, I would go to Snopes. I would then send them an email back and say, please don't send stuff until you verified them. Here's what really happened. So 
Sue, thank you for that. That's what I, unfortunately, I, you know what? I find I, I do Snopes with certain people. In other words, it, it's only used for certain people who you know in your family or friends. Who's, usually it's a family person, actually, not a friend who will send you um, unusual stuff. Um, Arnold definitely would delete it. It's outrageous. Um, Phyllis would maybe Google it, close it immediately, never pass it on. Yeah, we've got some Snopes. <laughs> Um, so right. I would say most people would ignore it. I, I, but what they didn't say is that most people would be irritated to get something like this. And I think that's for me, for example, when I get things like this are way worse when I get the political stuff from certain people who unfortunately are in the family. Right. Um, I have to figure out how to respond, right. but I know I get very upset by getting things that, that bother me. I don't know right. if this particularly bothers me. This seems very silly. Right. So, so I had a mixed reaction to this thing. So first of all, your reactions are very common. Um, by the way, Snopes wouldn't have helped in this case because only after I wrote an article about this that Snopes picked it up. So you can now find this video out there on Snopes, but it was only after I went down the rabbit hole to check it out. So um, usually I wouldn't have gone down any rabbit hole. I wouldn't have checked this out. I would have done what most of you done. I would have ignored it. I would have laughed. I would have tutted loudly to myself. Um, I maybe would have sent it to uh, someone who understood like I did as, you know, this is crazy, this is ridiculous. Um, but actually what happened the time that this hit me was I was thinking, this is really peculiar. This is not your regular anti-Israel stuff. This is such an outrageous claim. And I think maybe perhaps because I'm British, I'm from London, I know what Big Ben looks like. I know what Jerusalem looks like. It was claimed that this came from a clock tower that was uh, used to be at Jaffa Gate in, in Jerusalem. I was just thinking about the scale of Jaffa Gate and I was thinking about the size of Big Ben. I was thinking about the year in which Big Ben must have, you know, when the Houses of Parliament were built. This is all vague. I'm not a historian of this stuff. I was thinking, this really doesn't fit. What's this person thinking? You know, what can she possibly be thinking? Um, why is it, you know, why does she consider it to be something that's worth putting out there when it's so easy to refute? And I think that one of the things that you can see from our reactions, mine included, is that because we have so much of this information coming to us all the time, that it, you know, we don't have time to check everything out or to dispute everything or to get into an argument with anyone about it. We just want to clean out our inbox, get rid of the trash and get on with our lives. We don't have time for this. And because of this information overload, we don't really ever combat these kinds of claims and statements. We just try and get rid of them. Um, so I want to look at some of the things that this might be doing to us that relate back to believing and belonging. So this is my, so in a moment, I'm, you know, I'm going to take a little detour and then I'm going to come back to what I found out about this clip. So originally I just got this clip into my, I actually found it in WhatsApp. I went to look at the Twitter feed that it came from. But then I embarked on this whole journey down the rabbit hole. I went searching online. I did all kinds of things to find out what was going on. But I'm going to leave that to the side for the moment. We'll come back to it. And now I want to look at things that are happening more generally that perhaps explain our reactions and our behavior when faced with these kinds of, um, these kinds of social media uh, memes. So the first thing, this is a diagram from a, from a quite remarkable study uh, in which it compared how true news items and false news items get spread on social media. And this was a study that I think spanned an enormous amount of uh, many, many years. I think they basically took a, they do these, uh, they, they do these analyses on massive data sets and they took basically every, you know, they, they followed a particular set of false and true news stories on Twitter over a number of years. And this is what they found. What this diagram shows in, in, to sum up is false news stories travel up to seven times faster and further than true ones. So what you see in the green is a very short space of time that the news item hits a number of people and then it's, it's dead. And then what you see on the red line is that it continues and, and goes out to many, many more tens of thousands of users and is out there longer, okay? So people are interacting with it longer and it's, meet, and, and it's going on and on and on to more people. So this is one of the things that we are seeing is that full stories travel further and faster than others. Next.
Now, this looks much better live. Some of you may be familiar with this meme, uh, but it's an example of deep fake. So deep fake being where a video or a photograph, it can be documents, it can be photographs. In this case, it was a video clip in which someone else is voicing Obama's voice and the computer generated image of Obama has you know, adapted parts of the mouth of the comedian who's voicing his words. And um, it's almost impossible to tell that Obama isn't saying what he's being made to say. I don't know if you've come across these kinds of things before yourselves, there's plenty of them out there, but the sophistication with which anything can be made to look like anything is another major change in the way in which we share information and the way in which we believe. So this is another big technological development that has only happened really significantly in the last few years and its sophistication is growing exponentially day by day. So the ability to distinguish between whether something is fake, and whether something is real is, is getting much, much harder. It's much, much harder to tell the difference. So let's move on. Um, okay, this is a little bit more complicated. It's from a different study, but it's basically showing that depending on how much information you're sharing, the quality of the information gets higher or lower. If you're sharing a low amount of information, if the amount of incoming and outgoing information is low, the quality of the information generally remains high. If on the other hand, as you move right in this diagram, the amount of information coming in, the amount of information going out is low, is, is very high, the quality of the information drops dramatically. And the argument of the people in this paper which was published in Scientific American in, in 2020, they were using these data to make a larger point, um, is that information overload is itself a cause of our inability anymore to distinguish between true information and misinformation. It's just the sheer amount and our inability to stop and check that is lowering the quality of the information that we have at our disposal. Okay, let's move down a little bit more. What this is doing overall is affecting the degree to which we trust anything. And again, this is a picture that is a picture pretty much before the internet, and it's about trust in government. And this takes us through a number of uh, administrations between 1958 and 2015. And as you can see, that in general, people are trusting the government and trusting the president less and less from year to year. But if you go down to the next picture, you'll see in line with what we uh, saw earlier is that as far as young people are concerned, this is much strong, these reactions are much, much stronger. The drop in trust is considerably greater. So when you look at where, um, you know, what are the institutions that young people today trust in, this is 13 to 25 year olds, um, you'll see that, you know, only around, you know, that they have a very low degree of trust. Like these are all below the halfway point from organized religion down. Um, that they have very little trust in any source of authority. So what you're seeing is, as we saw with, re with relation to belief, that there were trends that existed before the internet and social media came about but these are being rapidly accelerated as people are using social media and social media has the, the tendencies and the biases that we just described. So if we can move down one more image. So, so on this chart, just to make it clear, it's you, they yeah. were asked uh, rate from one to 10, do you trust? And um, it, so the, the lowest one is on the, as the presidency, they only uh, they rated a four. Yeah. For 13, 25 year olds, okay. Thanks. Okay, so here, my, my attempt to summarize what is going on is that in the same way that we have moved from analog to digital in everything from audio to communications and so on, the same, I, am, I would argue, is happening with relation to belief and belonging. That 
The difference between analog and digital is fairly simple. In analog, the uh, message um, replicates reality in some way. That there's, you know, that there's, uh, <laughs> there's, it, it's not just a question of zeros and ones, but it's a continuum of things that, um, that there's a whole continuum from high to low and um, things which change with the context. When you move to digital, you translate the world into zeros and ones. Now, I'm using this as a metaphor. I'm not saying that because we're digital, we've gone to zero and one in terms of belief. But I want to use that analogy to describe or summarize what it is that we're seeing. Effectively, what we're seeing is, is that as we are overloaded with information, and we are unable to know whom to trust and whom not to trust, we need to find certain kinds of strategies for dealing with all of this information and for figuring out what to believe. And the ways in which people are doing it is to go to one or other of two extremes. On one extreme is to say, let's find a source of authority that I trust and that feels right and, and I, I feel like I can belong to it. And then I'm going to trust it or I'm going to go all in. I'm going to trust it 100%. And that's where I'm going to feel comfortable. Or on the other hand, I'm going to say, I don't trust anything. I'm going to be skeptical and I don't want to have anything to do with this. None, I, I don't believe anything until proven otherwise. And in that case, it's people who feel very unaffiliated or don't want to belong to anything because they don't trust these sources of authority, either for the truth of what they say or for being people who are reliable in the long run. And so what we're seeing, in effect, is a move from analog to digital in the sense that analog being a world in which we rate our belief from, you know, from low to high. There are some things we believe moderately and there are some things that we believe very strongly. There are some things to which we belong um, perhaps liminally. We're on the margins of and there are th some things that we feel that, we're very, that are very central to who we are and that we belong to them very intensively. That seems to be shifting to a world in which we're either or. We're either all in or all out. So can we move down a little bit more, please? Now, one of the interesting things about this is that when political commentators describe this situation or try to analyze this situation, especially when talking about politics or conspiracy theories, the way they do so is to compare it with religion. They say, for example, as in this headline from Salon, the church of QAnon, how right-wing conspiracy theories take the form of religious movements. And the idea there is, is that the notion of religion is sort of this archetype of this tight connection between believing and belonging. Very similar to how we started out with Spinoza and the, or, or my <laughs> carol singing, that it's either or, you're, if you're in, you have to, you know, you, you're within that um, realm of beliefs, and, and there's a very tight connection between believing and belonging. Salon takes up this idea, and this is quite common, people commenting on, on contemporary politics and saying, yeah, it's like religion. Everything's turning into a religion. I want to take issue with that. I want to come back and, and argue against that view. I think that this is a caricature of what religion is. And there's a couple of reasons why. So if we can move down. So th this picture here is Rembrandt's uh, The Sacrifice of, I think it's called Abraham's Sacrifice is the, actually the official name of the, the picture. So if you think about, uh, you know, religion, you know, if you think about what religion is and what religious faith is, it's actually a sense of believing in the absence of total evidence. It's about having a certain kind, like the idea of faith requires that there be doubt. If there is no doubt, there can be no faith. If you're 100% certain, it's not faith that you have, it's knowledge. And even from the earliest um, chapters of the Bible, including the Akedah, and, um, you know, which we'll read on Rosh Hashanah, um, there is uh, the, the notion of faith being something that has as its, the other side of itself, doubt, that without doubt there is no faith. That's really what religion is all about. It's a very different notion of what faith is. It's not a blind faith. It's not an association with something wrong. It's something that you believe, to, you, you believe knowing that there are, there are gaps and there are things that you don't know for certain. 
And if you did know for certain, what you would have wouldn't be faith, it would be knowledge. I want to look at another aspect of religion, which is often um, ignored by these kind of political commentaries on how extremist uh, ideologies are like religion. We see in many, many surveys, and this is just one example, that people are very ready to describe the degrees to which they believe in something. So if you look at this, this is a recent Pew survey of comparing children's religious beliefs with their parents, is that you can see they ask them, do you believe in God with absolute certainty? So some, there's a large percentage who believe with absolute certainty. There are some who believe that, you know, with a fair amount of certainty, some who aren't too certain, some who can't answer. And you can see that this notion of, of religious faith being something that's either or, all or nothing, actually is a mischaracterization of what religious faith is all about. And so um, this, this, so, 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 what we're seeing in the world um, of believing and belonging that is becoming this all or nothing, all in or all out, although there are some commentators who say, well, the world is just becoming a series of religious ideologies and groups. Um, I would say that that is a mischaracterization of what is going on. What is actually going on is that the middle ground that religion traditionally has held, which is living with uncertainty, and committing in the absence of certainty, that's what's being undermined by social media and the internet. So if we can, if we can move on from here. So given everything that we have seen in terms of these large scale moves in which we would have expected belief and belonging to become less tied to one another, one another, but in fact, they seem to be becoming more tightly connected. What do we do about our own communities or our own children as parents, as teachers, as members of religious communities? What might we, what might we do in the face of these very strong pulls in these, in, towards these two extremes? The pull towards extremist ideologies, religious orientations and so on on one hand, and the pull on the other hand towards dropping it all and, and uh, not belonging and not believing. What can we do in the face of these very, very strong pulls that seem to be way beyond our control in that you know, they're supported by technologies, they're, sort of, they're, they're supported by large social moves in the world at large. What might we do under these circumstances? So this is an opportunity for, for you guys to um, suggest um, and uh, afterwards, I'd like to, you know, bring this to a close and make some suggestions of my own. And don't forget, people ask, they want to know what happened to Big Ben. So we have to get back. Oh, of to course. The Big ben. Okay. So, so, you know, while people are chatting, I, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for people to chat while people are chatting their potential solutions. I mean, I asked the question and it, it appeared to me that you do have, you know, First of all, we also have people intentionally misleading other people, whether it's the Big Ben thing we'll get to, but we, we, we certainly have other countries that are waging war, for example, on the United States, on the West, by putting out false information. And one of the challenges that we have is to figure out what is true and what is not true. And the second thing is we also have people, people do trust different periodicals. Some people, for example, would trust anything the New York Times publishes or the LA Times or whatever their paper is. But, but there were comments here by saying, but you still need to understand that your newspaper has a bent, has a slant, has a, um, a, you know, a certain way of looking at it. Whether, I mean, I know the particular concern I would assume is Israel and the, like the New York Times may report Israel a certain way and people, some people don't like that reporting. So, so even stuff that you trust um, is gonna have a slant to it. And I think people are, are just, yeah, very much overwhelmed by all the information and trying to figure out what they can and cannot trust. So let's see what people are trusting. Um, Wendy says, don't pay attention to social media um, or check um, Snopes on everything you read. But of course, we're inundated by social media and people around us are inundated by social media and we can't check Snopes and Snopes doesn't have an answer to everything. So that's part of the challenge. Um, people ask questions like, how do, we, how do we combat the fake news? Like we know that's intentionally fake. That's been planted in, in, here in the United States to, to divide us further. Linda says it's important to go to various sources before, before forming an opinion. 
Um, Gail says, support organizations that do evidence-based research. Sue Arbuck says, the tough one is the gray area. It's hard for, it, it is hard for teens not to go, to not go all in. Um, Herb says we should bring accountability and responsibility back in, you know, into with parental responsibility and not give over uh, the public system of education. Set an example at home. Uh, Sandy says she thinks Snopes also has a bias. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Ellie. Yeah. Um, oh, look, we, uh, so I, I, I'm, I, I am much of what you're saying is what I'm going to actually demonstrate to some degree when we get back to Big Ben. So I, so I agree with many of the comments that uh, you've just read out. Um, but let's move down and see some of the things that practically people can do under these circumstances. Because, uh, and this actually relates to the earlier question about how much is this to do just with social media or also to do with education. So there are a number of people who've been trying to figure out what do we do in the face of all this information overload? And in fact, um, there are a number of people in the field of education in particular who've been wondering um, very seriously, well, you know, what good is, you know, a, a lot of the educating that we're doing, for example, in history or in political science or in uh, civics or in social studies, if we're not really preparing people to deal with this, if we continue with business as usual, we're going to be just feeding in to the uh, confusion and the sense of overwhelm that we have already. We need to come up with something. So one of the more interesting uh, groups that have been doing some research on this is actually a colleague of mine, Sam Weinberg, I've actually done some research with him on religion in a, in a different context. But he has a group at Stanford University that for the last, I guess, five to 10 years have taken on this challenge. And one of the more interesting things that they did was is that they did a number of studies in which they compared how students, history professors, and fact checkers at leading newspapers and magazines read the same kinds of internet information. They sent them to a website and they asked them to try and figure out the credibility of what they were reading. In some cases, the credibility was extremely low and this was engineered that way. In some cases, the credibility was extremely, extremely low. In some cases, it was very high credibility. And what they gave the participants in these studies to do was to figure out how credible the information was. And what they discovered was, is that it's not just students who are really bad at it. You might have assumed that students would be great at it because they're digital natives and they know how to find their way around the internet. Not so. They weren't much better. They, 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 were, they were worse than history professors. History professors who are good at looking at the credibility of documents and assessing the feasibility of things that they're reading. They were a little better, but they were also pretty bad. But the people who completely put them in the shade was fact checkers. And what they did in this research group, Weinberg's research group, was to look at what was it that these fact checkers were doing that was different from everybody else. And what they found was they were doing something called lateral reading. Now, lateral reading is instead of trying to go deep into the internet page that they were looking at, go to the about page, try and find out what the source of the information was, they immediately opened up a number of different tabs. One of them would be Wikipedia, another one would be a general Google search. They would do these quick and dirty lateral moves. They'd go out of the document and out there into the world in order to figure out what else they could learn quickly about the source of the information. And as soon as they hit upon some kind of a controversy or some kind of critique, they zoned in on it and to, to see if there was, uh, it had any kind of legs. So they did something very different. And in fact, it's very, it's almost opposite to what we generally teach in higher education and in, in high school. And generally what we, what we teach is close reading, people going deep into a particular source and trying to make sense of it. And in this case, the fact checkers who were most successful at judging credibility, they did the opposite. They went out of the document and they compared it with other sources out there. And interestingly, one of the most relied upon sources was Wikipedia, which often gets a very hard beating from people who are, uh, you know, from history teachers who are giving their students uh, a task of, uh, of writing an essay. So that's one of the things that we learned. So when I, I, ha I happened to know Sam and I happened to have read these papers. And so the first thing I did when faced with Big Ben is I started reading laterally. So if we could move on and I'll take you through, take you out of the, out of the rabbit hole. <laughs> so the first thing I did is I went to Wikipedia and I looked up Big Ben. Uh, because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't fit. Nothing, nothing. Fit. 
nothing clear. So I, I wanted to know when was this, when was Big Ben built? Um, how big is it? Uh, when was the bell um, installed? And the clock and so on. So the first thing is you very quickly on, on Big Ben, you find that the size of Big Ben and the year in which it was installed make it impossible for this story to have any kind of uh, credibility at all. So if you move to the next, if you move to the next one, you'll see, I then looked up the, the clock tower at Jaffa Gate. And sure enough, there was a clock tower at Jaffa Gate. It was, it was built in 1907 and it was taken down in 1922. It stood 13 feet tall. Now that compares with 316 feet tall uh, of the tower in which Big Ben is situated in London. So if you just scroll down, you'll see pictures of the two. This is the short-lived clock tower at Jaffa Gate. You'll see it's a very small and pretty ugly <laughs> installation that the British took down for aesthetic reasons in 1922. And then below that, you'll see Big Ben and just the size of these two things is, is completely incomparable. In fact, the bell in Big Ben uh, wouldn't even fit within the tower, let alone the, the, the clock uh, section of the, of the tower in Jerusalem. So, I didn't have to go any further than this if I wouldn't have wanted to. It, were, it had already made clear that the claim was entirely implausible. The years didn't match. Big Ben was built 50 years before the clock tower was even, uh, uh, was even uh, built in, in Jerusalem. The dimensions of the two buildings and the two clocks, the two dials <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the bells just didn't fit. I could have stopped here. So if all I wanted to do was to disprove or to debunk that tweet, I was done. I didn't need to do anything else, but my curiosity had been piqued, so I kept going. And one of the things that I did was I thought, you know, it's all very well that she's clearly making this up, but what are her motives? Who is this person? So if you look very carefully on this picture, you'll see that there's a little watermark on the picture. Can you see? Um, I, it might be, can you see there's a little TikTok sign and underneath it, there's a name. You see that? So it turns out that every, every uh, movie that is uploaded to TikTok um, has a watermark of the person who uploaded it. So I followed the watermark to the account of the TikTok, the TikTok account. And if we move down, you'll see who, who it is. And I saw, sure enough, a Palestinian woman who has a number of interesting stories and a number of interesting recipes, but this is her. And there's another thing that you can do. If you look down at the bottom of this, um, there's certain things that you can do technically to find out when something was uploaded. So if you click, if you right click on a movie that's uploaded uh, in Chrome and you do control U, you can find out the source um, and the date that this was uploaded. And it turns out that this was uploaded you know, in the afternoon of December the 19th, 2019. So, you're looking at something that was very, very recent. And then I looked online to see if there were any other, if there was any other evidence of this story that only, that the, uh, this was the earliest version of this story that I could find online. Okay, so meaning that this was clearly something invented. Even if this woman had, you know, based on some kind of um, oral tradition from, you know, the, Jew, the, the Palestinians of, uh, of Jerusalem, um, she was too young. I mean, she looks like she's in her 60s, 70s, perhaps, uh, for this to be a first or even second generation story. This, this either was completely made up or it was some kind of an oral tradition that had begun relatively recently. Okay, let's keep going. So you can see that one of the things that you can do is that there are ways when we have the time and the energy to go and do the Snopes thing and try and figure out these things ourselves. So if you could move down uh, one more page, in the spirit of Rabbi Tarfon, that of course, in, under conditions of information overload, we obviously can't go exploring and go down the rabbit hole with every kind of nonsense that comes our way whether it be, you know, anti-vax or whether it be anti-Israel, whatever it might be. Um, we can't go after everything, but we can and should go after one or, you know, one or two things just to see 
that we're not losing our minds entirely. And sometimes we need to do it in order to demonstrate to others that it's possible to get to the bottom of things when we have to. I'll just have two more things to go and then we'll finish up. The second thing that I think we need to be very careful about doing is when it comes to belonging, actually, let's move on to the last one. I'll have to drop this because I don't have time to get into it. We'll just go to the last point. In terms of making the case to um, either if it's our children or our uh, people that we want to engage in our community, it's, it's, we, have to do, we have some work to do in order to reinstate the notion of religious faith being something other than all or nothing, of religious faith being something other than being all in and 100% and certain. And this quote, I think, actually sums up that view very nicely, and it's something that we have to somehow work to recover. To realize the relative validity of one's convictions and yet stand for them unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. To mar more than this is perhaps a deep and incurable metaphysical need, but to allow it to determine one's practice is a symptom of an equally deep and more dangerous moral and political immaturity. And I think that's the biggest challenge for us is to find the ways to engage people, re-engage people in understanding the true nature of what faith is and the ability to live under conditions of uncertainty without giving up on our commitments. Do you have time just to do some wrap up questions here? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Ellie? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. So um, some of the questions that came up in this discussion, when you, I think what you're trying, I mean, there are many things you're trying to do, but one of the things was talking about religion and how you think religion differs from what we're seeing. However, um, many of us have interacted with um, people who don't represent mainstream, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say mainstream, I mean, evangelic, e evangelicals. And by the way, we have them in the Jewish world too, because the evangelic, I mean, we have Haredim are evangelical, right? They're not modern Orthodox, they're not conservative reform reconstructionist, um, just like evangelical Christians. And the question is, is, is evangelical religion, by the way, Muslims, there are many Muslims that are evangelical as well. Um, can you use that word with Muslims? <laughs> I don't know. But the, uh, the point is that there are many people that don't approach religion the way you say it, where, where it's faith and doubt, it's certainty. And, um, and that, that is what we're seeing in the religion of QAnon, for example. And that's maybe where, where people are overlapping that there are certain things we're seeing on the internet that is like a religion because they're, they're saying it's like e evangelical religion, that they do believe there is a truth, that there, there is no doubt. And, um, and you know, we're sitting here helpless because we see, we see this, these untruths being passed along as truths. And we see so many people, such a great percentage in, in America alone, believing things that are just not true. Uh, and so... I, kind of, I guess I go back to your question of your analysis of this is not religion, but maybe it is religion because it is, it seems to be tied into evangelical approaches, um, reading text from people who are certain that they know the truth, as opposed to uh, people who are here on CSP who know they don't know the whole truth, but are committed to their Judaism and committed to a path of learning. Right. So it's clear, you know, um, I, it's clear that there are many different kinds of expression of religion, including evangelical or ultra-Orthodox or fanatical. There are many kinds of that, of religion, and it would be foolish to discount those. And they, are, they account for a very significant proportion of religious people in the world, but they are certainly not the majority of religious people in the world. And one of the things that I think is um, playing to our disadvantage in the Jewish community is that we are allowing the the, the mindset of the digital age of it's either all or nothing to dictate or, uh, or to, uh, to dictate the way in which we respond to people in relation to religion. It's like, it's like in the same way that, um, in the same way that people are failing to make a distinction between the, the credibility of any kind of story. It's like, it's like everything is up for grabs. I don't believe anything. I don't believe anything I read in the newspaper. 
everybody has a bias, everybody has a slant. That is almost like a throwing up of the hands in response to information overload and saying, we can't tell the difference. And I think that in the same way that people who care about the news or care about science can't afford to throw up their hands and have to choose their battles, but to demonstrate the difference between what an opinion is and what a fact is. The same in a, in a, by analogy applies to religion is that there is a task upon religious leadership today to recover that middle ground of what faith is in the context of doubt, of what it means to, to live a committed religious life uh, under conditions of uncertainty. And that requires a lot more work today than it did in the past because of these very strong pulls out there um, that are being fed by social media. You showed us the poll that younger people, millennials, are, are, have really dropped religion in, in, a, very, in, in a great amount. Um, so what are they replacing it with? Interestingly enough, um, for, well, first of all, there's two parts to it because um, religion includes all kinds of things. It includes belief. It also includes participation in community. And one of the things that they have not replaced to a large extent is participation in community. Online community is much thinner than anything offline. And we are seeing that there are many um, phenomena today among millennials and Gen, and, and Gen Z or iGen, depending on how you call them, that uh, show a kind of anomie, a dislocation and a lack of connection with other people. And so that part isn't really very much being replaced. But on the other hand, in terms of belief, you are actually seeing a rise in all kinds of spiritual beliefs, um, all kinds of beliefs in uh, various, what they're dissociating more from than anything, else, than anything else is the notion of organized religion or religion that has authority over them. But you are seeing, it's not necessarily being replaced by it, it's, but they're not, you're not seeing the same dramatic decrease in spiritual beliefs like belief in an afterlife or something like that. So people have been chatting. Yes, I should have used the word fundamentalism as a, evangelicals or example of a fundamentalist. And so every religion has fundamentalists. Certainly we Jews have fundamentalists and um, you know, Muslim fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists. And I think in a way we're living in a world of fundamentalism and maybe that's, that's the word to use. And it's mostly associated with religion but it can be associated with uh, people who are fundamentalists in, in arguing what they believe and um, you know, following, you know, following crazy uh, things they read online, as opposed to being willing to critique, to ask questions, to think on their own, which is a scary world we're living in. I think I think the issues I'm seeing here are people are saying they still don't feel they have answers. People, we can't, we all can't sit online all day and debunk everything that's coming out there. And there are people that that really believe these things, the people that are putting out things to, uh, on, on purpose to confuse people, to separate us here in the United States. Um, obviously, there's a lot that's put out there against Israel um, and is focused on sowing discontent and um, you know, uh, to separate people from Israel, whether they're Jews, including Jewish, young Jewish people and not. So I think I see a lot of people who are very upset on this issue because they don't understand they don't understand what we can really do. <laughs> I think that, I mean, you know, we can't find the whole world. Maybe I'll ask you a simple question. If you get a, an email from your, your mother-in-law or your mother-in-law's grandmother that is so wrong, how do you respond to that? How would you respond to that in a nice way, but in order to shut it down? At least, at least start the job. How do you do that? So the first thing I would do is I would actually go down because I feel a certain kind of responsibility for for uh, being, since I have certain tools at my disposal, which others don't, I would go a little bit down a rabbit hole and I would try and identify at least some kind of counter argument or at least some kind of flaw in the argument. I try and figure out what really is going on. And what I have tried to demonstrate in relation to Big Ben, and we can send the, the link to the larger article that I wrote about this, that gives you a lot of practical advice about how to do this yourself. You don't need to be a professor or have lots of time on your hands to do some of this stuff that it is possible every now and then, not every day or every week or even every month, but every now and then it is important, I think, to go a little bit down and deep into something in order to be able to demonstrate to someone you care about that it's possible to 
be convinced into something without it having any basis. And to remind them of the fact that there are certain kinds of things which you can demonstrate the opposite of, that you can demonstrate otherwise. So this actually happened, by the way, during the last war in Israel, is that there was a lot of interesting argument and counter argument. This happened a lot on social media. There was some awful stuff on social media with celebrities siding and having all kinds of things going on, written about this as well. But you also saw some very interesting, almost guerrilla tactic um, counter examples to this and people countering them explicitly on social media. It's a battle that you have to join to some extent now. For most of the people who are participating in this conversation today, um, that's not necessarily an option. But it is, I think, a responsibility for everyone who's in this conversation to you know, take an example here or there to not let everything go past. So in terms of my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law sent me something that was ridiculous. I would, as I say, first of all, try and I do a little bit of homework and try and come back. And but I would say, look, I, I, you know, that doesn't seem credible to me, but I would find an opportunity to find something that did bother me. And it was interesting to me and that I could go and search it out or I could find an, an important article demonstrating how something was made to look one way when it was really another and present that to that person. Because if I care about them enough, I want to be able to, cap, to come back and rebalance the, you know, the, the, the conversation with them, but not every time. Information overload is information overload. We don't have the time to do this on every single news item, on every single meme that comes our way. We have to let a lot of this stuff go through. And as a result, we have to have, we have to develop rules of thumb for how do we trust things. That means that we're in a kind of a bind in that we have to choose our sources of information, but we also have to be prepared every now and again to go down a rabbit hole in order to, to check that we're not being led completely astray. In particular, as parents and grandparents, this is something that I think is especially important. I see this with my kids. I have teenage and 20-year-old uh, kids. Um, when, when, I, when, when, when they present me something or, that, or, I, or we're discussing something that's about current affairs, it could be about Israel, it could be about something else. And they say, um, you know, well, you know, this is just someone's opinion or this isn't based on any fact or so on. Um, I will go to the trouble, not every time, but I will go to the trouble of showing them and taking them on a trip through the data because I don't want them to get to a situation where it's okay for them to say, it's just everybody is entitled to their opinion and that's that. I want them to appreciate the distinction between fact and opinion. And I think that's our responsibility, not to let all this just flow by, that we have occasionally to, to take a stand. Yeah, of course, the, the frustrating part of this whole process is that, um, and it's coming through the notes as well, which is that you can be a responsible person who reads the media, who responds to the media, who's logical, but the person that you're interacting with doesn't is not going to share your same approach to the world. In other words, they are, they are whatever you say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many facts you show them. It doesn't matter the science you share with them. Um, and I think part of maybe part of the quick, I mean, it just seems like in the last few years, it really has been a massive, um, you know, uh, challenge to all of us. And part of it is that we also need um, people in power who are willing to fight for truth and not, you know, support uh, people who come up with um, crazy theories. And that, particularly in the United States, I don't know what's happening in Israel, I don't have any other countries, but I think we've lost, we don't have that backstop anymore. We haven't had that backstop. We'll, we'll see what happens over the next few years, maybe politics. I mean, and, and by the way, in, in a way it's, you know, um, it's, it's a responsibility of all politicians, you know, certain have certain politicians here in the country have more power than others. And we need them to, to share the truth with us and not, um, and not um, conspiracies. So we, we've had challenges in America and I don't know. And I think that's really a lot of the data, what you're seeing and a lot of the, of the younger generation um, who've given up, it's because they're living in this world right now. This, this, it's not just the overload of the world is that there's no one who they respect who's standing up against this. In fact, there are people who have power who are, who are in reinforcing this stuff. So, um, of course, I don't know if we've answered that many questions, but we've, uh, I think we've explored, we've explored this issue. We, we could go on for a few more hours, but it is 147 here later in New York City and other parts. So I don't, uh, I don't want to keep you guys longer and I do have to get back to work as well. So any parting words for, for us to get us 
uh, other than maybe turning off social media and the news one day a week, preferably on maybe Saturday, <laughs> anything else we should do that uh, would uh, leave us feeling a little better after this program? Yeah, well, look, um, I, I, I think that one of the things that is uh, surprising is how easy it is to take things apart. There's a few tools that you can use to really take a, any given story apart and actually find out what was going on. The fact that we don't have the time to do it doesn't mean that it's not possible. And so I think the biggest hope out there is for us to not let, you know, not it, it is for us to take um, the a proactive approach when it comes to our friends, our relatives, our children, and whatever position of power we might be in, whether it's as a parent in my case, or whether it's as a professor in a university, or whether it's as someone who's a member of a community, to uh, insist gently on uh, the value of recognizing our own uncertainties. The fact is that I found many a time, it's true, there are many people who refuse to countenance any kind of uncertainty. They are totally certain, totally certain and are unable to be convinced by anything. There's no point having a conversation with them. However, there is a point having a conversation with anyone who you think is able to countenance that kind of uncertainty or is ready to have a conversation with you and is ready to take on, to, on board things that you can show them. And I think that's much more the case than we tend to realize. I think that the, the, the picture of these extremists is true of a very particular group of extremes. But what's happening, I think, in the middle ground is that we're generally uh, capitulating too soon or we're letting too much of this overload wash over us without us stopping and taking stock and figuring out how ourselves to deal with it and how we might communicate it to the people that we care about. So I think there's plenty that we can do and that um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we, are, we have a responsibility to do. Thank you. And, and Linda, I think is right. She texted the extremists are also very loud. The extremists are loud and that's the problem. The extremists represent minority of the people. They always have, they always will be, but the 10% of the people or 10, 15% shout down the rest of us. So the middle of us, the middle group here, which represents most of humanity, hopefully, let's just be a little louder. And also, I do think that one of the problems with social media is, you didn't mention, is that it, it has given a platform to these extremists. In the past, you could ignore them, you know, you could, and now they, they have the ability to access you in many different ways. And they're given disproportionate, I would say, uh, impact on the news because remember everybody the news is it wants to get you on their news show so I often find that headlines and, and I, don't, I don't go to certain sites even the sites I go to the headlines bother me but they're they're doing that on purpose to pull me in to read so um, I think it is important to take a break sometimes from all that stuff and know that headlines are trying to pull you in and get you very upset but yes I think that um, the people who are the you know the people who are the loudest tend to be the extremists but I, I, I agree with you I don't think they represent the majority of the people. Let's hope they don't. So maybe that's a positive way to end. Thank you, um, Ellie. Thank you, everybody, for participating in this discussion. We uh, head for a very different topic tomorrow, a uh, bibliodrama, and uh, the father of bibliodrama, Peter Pitsley. Hope you'll join us for that. Have a, if I don't see you, have a great Shabbat. And uh, Slichot starts this weekend. Hashanah is coming up. Lots to think about. This world is uh, literally on fire. <laughs> so particularly in California. So uh Keep safe, everybody. Take care. See you later.